Welcome to your source for comic book news and culture. Rendition starts now. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Nick. Every week, Variant Edition brings you the best that comics has to offer. It's a half hour full of news, reviews, interviews, and well, basically anything we think is comic related. And it's obvious that we love the comics. I mean, we talk about them every week. But it's time to inject some more of that comic related stuff. That's right, the statue reviews are back. This week, we look at zombies and monochromatic women. And that could prove to be interesting. We've also got the return of my radioactive minute. It's been too long since we've had any kaiju fun. Not to mention, we've also got some superhero 101 coming up. It's a good show, so uh, we're gonna get on with it now. All right, guys. First review of the week, right here, Captain Marvel number one. Now, this is the book that Lee Weeks was born to draw. It's great. He keeps the classic rendition of Jim Starlin's Captain Marvel from the 1970s up to date. Didn't change a thing. Right down to you know the last inch of the costume looks great. Now, there's a lot going on in the first issue of this book. Um, we're dealing with uh, an apparent religion that's you know dedicated to Captain Marvel called the Brotherhood of Hala. Don't know what's going on there. It looks kind of weird, kind of like a messiah complex thing going on there. No pun intended with other stuff that's going on in the Marvel U. Um, a lot of people are wondering what happened to Marvel after the whole Civil War fallout. If you guys remember, he got left in charge of the Negative Zone prison for all the superheroes and supervillains. But after the Civil War ended, he just kind of like, you know, disappeared. So there's a lot of catching up for that that's going to happen. Tony Stark's got a little bit involved in that stake here because he doesn't want him to mess up the past by dying now in the future. And. Captain Marvel's suffering from some kind of like, you know, memory lapse. He's got a lot of holes in his memory from being in the negative zone and just appearing in our time out of nowhere. So he's just looking for answers to some questions that he's been thinking about for the past couple months since the Civil War. And it's a really good book. You know, a lot's going to happen. I, it's a really interesting concept to take a character that died, that is still going to die at the end of his book. It's, it's, it's been said a lot of times. He's not going to live. He will die again at the end of his book, go back to his original time, henceforth not retconning anything. But... I can't wait to see where this book goes. I mean, the drawing's great. The writing's really good. Brian Reed knows his stuff. He's been around. So this, I, he's perfect fit for the book. And I'm really excited. And this is always, as you know, one of my favorite characters. So I can't wait to see where this book goes. House of M Avengers with uh, Luke Cage. I thought House of M was done. Like last year. I don't know why we're still getting House of M books, but I'll, I'll go with it. I, I kind of liked House of M. A lot of people didn't, but I kind of liked it. Um, what we've got here is it's kind of like his new origin story in the House of M world where he grows up with this guy Willis Stryker uh, not a really original name but okay Willis so he's he's angry at this guy Willis who happens to be a mutant that's got fangs and everything anyway he goes to jail because Willis frames him for heroin and he's in jail for a long time that the human mutant war started and has ended but he got out as they were running tests on him and behold he is now impenetrable skin and what is he going to do after 20 years of being in jail? He's going to go kill Willis, because that's what he wants to do. So he does it, kind of, but Willis actually blows himself up. It's a long story. Read the comic. Um, and he's like, okay, well, where are we going to go? Well, we can go to Hell's Kitchen, which is now being called Sapien Town. Oh, like Mutant Town, but because it's only the humans that have... Okay, cool, Sapien Town. And he's going to be like the new, like, you know, I'm the guy, so I killed this cockroach-looking guy, and I killed Hammerhead, and now I'm the corrupt crime, ki the kingpin of crime of Hell's Kitchen in Sapien Town. And he runs into other people, like Hawkeye, and, and Moon Knight, and Iron Fist, and a couple other people. And it's they're forming a new, I guess it would be called an illegal Avengers. They're not really the, uh, you know, one-stop shopping for the under the world crisis superheroes type market it's more like one-stop shopping if you want to make an evil syndicate of crime so okay new turn in avengers they're not fighting for good they're fighting for themselves trying to survive conquering things robbing people and taking money yeah i'll go with it i'll read it why not a uh, good book take a look at it art's not the greatest thing in the world but you go with it it's not bad all right everybody issue number three of lobster johnson and the iron prometheus man this story's getting hot if you read it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, the beginning was just like kind of a small detective story, but now it's going into this whole like evil power, the Vril or whatever. I'm not really like truly grasping this yet, but all I know is like some stuff's going down because these people didn't actually want the Prometheus suit. They wanted to harness the power that apparently the professor who made the suit understood. So they torture him and all this crap. And when he wouldn't give it up to him, they turn him into a brain in a tank. And get it from his memory, and they get what they need, and he's just a brain in a tank now. All this crap goes down, the guy in the Iron Prometheus suit, I think it was Mr. Sax, shows up, and the brain starts telling him all the stuff that's going on, and things just go downhill from there. 
Uh, everybody shows up and sees Mr. Sax there talking to the brain. They shoot the brain, which is kind of sad because he couldn't defend himself. And uh, Lobster Johnson just shows up and like starts kicking ass. Because, you know, he kind of, well, they're bad guys. And Lobster Johnson likes to bring justice. And he talks about how whenever somebody, like, melts away into a skeleton, he's like, ah, oh, that smell. And you look and you see, like, a pile of dead bones. Ah, oh, justice. Whatever, I like it. Um, is going more into that whole, uh, like, real deep paranormal, uh, other world, like, other dimension, other powers kind of thing. You know, the doctor's saying that, oh, this guy is the devil and all this other crap. But it's like a weird ancient race that used to be around forever before man and all this other stuff. And it goes back to, like, I don't know, that, like, Lovecraftian kind of stuff where it's like those ancient evils that have been there forever just slumbering. And at the end of the issue, they awaken that ancient evil and you see it come out. It's like this giant, like, newt man monster thing. Once again, Lovecraft inspired, but you know, that's Magnola for you. Story's great. Issue was great. I'm just really looking forward to like four and five to kind of like patch up all the things that I'm kind of scratching my head about with issue three. Hoping that goes down. And once again, it's just Lobster Johnson kicking everybody's ass. It's great stuff. Check it out. Hey guys, how you doing? It's Lewis back with the statue for this week. Now, what we got right here is the absolutely beautiful, stunning, straight from the art and cover of, I believe it was issue four, Red Sonia, the Adam Hughes Red Sonia statue. Which is just like a magnificent, you know, magnificent, has a whole Sin City vibe of, you know, no skin tone, no color, except for the hair and lips and eyes, which are green. This statue is absolutely great. It was put up by Dynamic Forces. The sculpting is so dead onto the cover, you know, minus the snowflakes, which is kind of hard to, you know, do in a statue. Um, the base, she's on snow, on one knee, ready to do battle. And the sword, it's kind of a tricky piece, because if you're not careful, she just kind of pops out. It goes back in, but the statue can't really mess with it too much. The sculpting on her armor and just the outfit she wears is unbelievable because it looks like, you know, the shingles that Captain America has on his, you know, uniform, but they're just, you know, a lot less of it and there's more skin to show. Um, the hair is just great. That This is what you call pretty much a perfect statue. It's, she's in an action pose and everything about the statue is action. The hair, the body language, everything. The statue's, I think it retails for about uh, close to $200. I think it was $1.75. So if you're a big Red Sonja fan, this is a must-have because they totally nailed Adam Hughes' artwork. And it's really hard to do that when it comes to sculpting, you know, figures. Especially if you've seen, you know, the Superman, Batman ones. It's, it's either hit or miss. So there's more to come out. There's a Michael Turner one and a Mark Silvestri. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But if you're a big Red Sonja lover, you got to have this piece. And that's it for this week. And I'll see you guys next time. New Avengers Illuminati 5 of 5. The wonderful conclusion of the Illuminati. What are we looking at? Um, we are looking at... Well, first off, it's it's the last meeting of the Illuminati, if you will. It's, it, you know, Iron Man's chilling. There's a body in a bag. Dr. Strange shows up and says, well, whose body is that? Is that Captain America? No. Okay, well, why don't you open the bag and show me? Because, you know, I want to see. And he's like, now we're waiting for everyone to get here. Four human life forms detected. Fantastic. This first guy shows up. That's right, it's Black Bolt, and he wants to know what's in the bag, too, because we all want to know what's in the bag at this point. And then, slowly but surely, everybody else shows up, including Xavier, and he's walking. Long story, not getting into that right now, because I'm not even sure about that one, and I like Xavier in a wheelchair, like I've said before on the show. Anyway, he finally opens up the bag, and it's a whole page spread here of Electra scroll, scroll Electra, Electra scroll, in the bag. And, um, they're like, so what does this mean? Well, it means that she was a scroll, and she was working on the ground as the Yakuza, and Strange couldn't detect it with magic, and Wolverine's mutant sense can detect it, and we couldn't figure it out this way or this way, so we don't know who to trust anymore. To which somebody in the Illuminati says, that's right, you don't know who to trust anymore. Kaboom! And almost everyone should be dead, but they survived somehow, I don't know how, I'm a little bit confused on how, you know. Basically, I want to know why Xavier didn't get put back in the wheelchair with the explosion, that's all I'm saying! Anyway, what we have, by the end of the comic, there's a fight, he's got friends, there's other things going on, still haven't told you who that guy was because I want you to read the damn comic. By the end of the comic, it's like, Namor's like, I don't trust you, I'm going away, and everyone's just like, he's right, we can't trust each other. And they all go away, except for Iron Man, who's left with a dead body, thinking about how he probably killed Captain America at the wrong time and the wrong place. 
That's right, Tony. You screwed over the world, and now there's probably a scroll invasion that we have no idea about, and this is going to be the springboard for a huge event that I can't wait to read. Um, pick it up. If you haven't read Illuminati at all, now would be a great time to go back and read it all so you know the whole story from the beginning to the end. It's a really well-written book. Bendis did a hell of a job setting up a really nice big event, and I can't wait to see where it goes. All right, guys. Next review of the week right here, Thor number four. Now, if you've been paying attention, Thor's been out looking for the other Asgardians in mortal form. Kind of has the whole Eternals vibe going on. If you read the Eternals a couple months ago, um, so this issue is a pretty, you know, pretty quick one. Kind of rushed through, but I, it was still a good issue. You got Thor doing the whole alias thing. He's got the Donald Blake side going on, so it's a good, fair, even, you know, amount of face time for these guys. You got Donald Blake and Thor. So it starts off with Donald Blake. You know, he's doing the whole good doctor thing. He's helping out a refugee camp, you know, aiding sick kids and stuff and helping out with wounds. And they get ambushed by, like, you know, this, you know, this guerrilla, you know, group of, you know, uh, not terrorists, but, you know, like, you know, militants or whatever. And so they're attacked. The whole place gets bombed. Thor, you know, uh, Donald Blake, excuse me, does the whole, you know, Shazam thing, grabs a stick. Boom. Thor comes in, starts kicking some serious ass, takes names. And it just goes by really quick. In the end of the issue, he's able to uh, stumble upon... Volstag, Fandral, and I forget the last guy. Last guy's name, not not Hemdal, the other guy who guards the Rainbow Road. I forget. So he stumbles onto those three guys, which is basically his whole army. That's them, and um, and that's the end of the issue. I mean, it's a pretty good book. Uh, they're kind of rushing through this real quick. I'm still interested to see how Loki's going to come back because it'd be really weird to see if Thor has to bring him back, or if Loki finds his own manipulative way to make his way back onto this realm. But all in all, great book, great art. I love Thor. And I hope this goes, you know, this finishes with a big bang. Hey guys, doing Toy and Statue reviews again. So I decided why not take a look at this wonderful Spider-Man and Mary Jane here. This is from uh, Diamond Select. Uh, this is a based off of a Soy Dan cover. This is obviously from Marvel Zombies. And uh, some of the things I like to note on this is that this is a Spider-Man piece that is very subdued in color. It's it's very dark, and uh, I think that really reflects highly of the Marvel Zombies universe in general there. But you got a great skeleton there with uh, his hip bone and upper leg bone there, just or femur, I guess would be the name of it. But it, it's just it's positioned correctly for the rest of the statue. It, this is just a nice piece. And uh, one other thing to, to note here is that there's no base. The base is actually Mary Jane's uh, dress. They're, they could have done like the, the cheesy, you know, like top of the cake with flowers that are all moldy type thing, but they didn't. They decided no. We'll just we'll just use her dress, and I, and I like that a lot for some reason. It just kind of like stands alone as as self a piece, and I think when I get married, this will be on top of my wedding cake. Hey everybody, I'm Nick, and this is your radioactive minute. So we've all seen, despite the fact that comic fans for some reason don't think that giant monsters really belong in it, but I see the ads for these wonderful DVDs in such comics like oh, I don't know Batman and Robin All Stars. Yeah, it was in there. Classic Media, that awesome company that did the really, really bitchin' two-disc DVD for the original Gojira with the English and Japanese versions, have been giving us a slew of Godzilla goodness. They've given us Godzilla Raids Again, which has never been on DVD and hasn't been on VHS for years. Mothra vs. Godzilla, which is one of the all-time best and most beloved Godzilla films ever. Geezer the Three-Headed Monster, introducing Godzilla's arch-nemesis and probably the all-time badass giant dragon. And Invasion of the Astro Monster, the direct sequel to Geezer the Three-Headed Monster. These films are done in such a wonderful way that I don't even know how Classic Media pulled this off. I hear Toho's kind of a pain to work with, but they did it in spades. They brought you such good video quality for these actual special features that are worth watching, audio commentary with either fans or writers of different publications like G-Fan and Giant Monster magazines and stuff like that, but they do such a wonderful job. The DVD cases aren't your normal, like, snap kind of case. It's folded over, but they have awesome covers on it. It's like the original Japanese one print. Any kaiju, and especially Godzilla fans, should definitely buy these for the reasonable price of 15 bucks a pop. That's pretty good. Punisher World Journal number 13. Uh, what we've got is the rhino is going to do a bank heist, not surprisingly. Um, and he runs in, and, you know, everything's going cool. He's like, we're going to go to old school. We're just going to, I'm going to hit the safe. You guys are going to work crowd control. We're going to get a bunch of money. We're going to get out. Until a security guard actually trips over a stone and, and impales himself on a wrought iron spike type bar thing and dies. So later on at the hideout, they're like, they're like, oh, rhino's like, I think I killed that guy. I didn't mean to kill that guy. I just was trying to get money, and I killed that guy. And then the Punisher shows up. 
then he's in like the rhinos all like, oh god, you don't have that Satan glove thing, do you? And he's like, the Satan's claw? No, that was just to soften you up. This is to kill you. And he's got like a mini missile launcher. And he blows him out of the house, out of the apartment complex, down to the ground, and then is sending out a bunch of them. 30 seconds earlier, we find that that Spider-Man is like two blocks away when he hears the first explosion and he's talking to like a hot dog vendor, which is hilarious because they're really sticking with the whole like Peter Parker unmasked and Spider-Man thing. Because he's like, so I says to the guy, I says, oh, God. And like, then there's an explosion and he's like, catch you later, Lenny. And Lenny's like, catch you later, Pete. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice little, oh, yeah, okay, everyone knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man because they're not doing too much of that and they should be doing more of it, I feel as a fan. Anyway, I digress. What we've got, uh, Spider-Man swings in, saves Rhino from a cluster of explosions, and then they're on top of a rooftop, and it's like, oh, here comes, uh, you know, Punisher over the edge, webbed him down, and he's like, oh, Rhino, you try this every time, and I do this every time, and, like, kick your ass, basically, is what's going on. And then he's like, he's like, and that's how you think. Dart my neck, done. <laughs> you know, like, and you're like, where did that come from? And of all people... The new version of Craven the Hunter shows up, and at the end we find out that he's building a zoo. I don't know what's going on, but I think I'm with Rhino when Rhino says at the end, I, God, I hope the Punisher finds me. Way back, we started something called Off the Shelf, which is basically we take a graphic novel and review graphic novels, because mainly on the show we review comics. So I'm taking that responsibility, and I'm going to start reviewing some graphic novels again. So the first two that we're going to be looking at are The Middleman, Volume 3, Inescapability, and something really cool called Tales of Terror. Um, so let's start off with Middleman. Um, it's the third volume. Basically, there's this secret, I don't know, governmental organization that handles everything weird. Uh, apparently, this world doesn't have a men in black. They just got this organization. Something weird happens. These guys take care of it. Um, there's a middleman and there's an assistant. Um, it's a third volume, so it's kind of coming into the middle of it. Um, no pun intended. Uh, it's really cool. It's just fun. It's just a lot of fun. It's uh, written by Javier Grilla Marsoc, and he he's a TV writer. So hopefully there'll be a bunch more of these because now he's not writing for TV. The second thing that I want to talk about today is Tales of Terror by Eduardo Rizzo. Now, this book is very cool. Eduardo Rizzo, for those of you who know, does 100 Bullets uh, for Vertigo, and that's sort of his American claim to fame. Well, Dynamite has been licensing quite a bit of his material that he did, you know, because he's a South American artist, um, and translating it and bringing it to the United States. And this uh, Tales of Terror reads like the old EC comics. There's lots of horror stories, but they're not all horror stories. It's very much like Tales from the Crypt. It's uh, a lot of fun. It ranges from the more humorous to the really scary. Um, one of the ones I liked a lot was Frankenstein gets, you know, defrosted, walks south, comes to the United States, and, you know, things happen that probably you wouldn't expect to happen. Um, because the world is no longer afraid of him because they see freaks everywhere. So, I mean, that's sort of like, you know, these stories run the gamut. A lot of fun, really scary, and Eduardo Rizzo's art is really well-suited to um, doing things of the horror genre. So um, I hope that Dynamite continues putting out his uh, South American work because it's really great. So we'll be back again and uh, take a look at a few more books off of the shelf. Superhero comics. You all read them or you wouldn't be watching this show. But the question we found ourselves asking earlier today was, where do they come from? And yes, we could take a second and talk about the original comics called Funny Books, but we're not going to do that because we're just talking about superheroes. In fact, the first hero comic debuted on February 17th, 1936, The Phantom. He was the first hero to put on a costume and fight crime, which he did through death-defying stunts despite his human capabilities. But just a little before The Phantom would debut, we first saw The Clock, a masked detective who would be the first character who used a mask to cover up his face, hence starting the whole dual personalities that all superheroes would later use. 
except for Superman, of course, who was a journalist and couldn't afford a mask, so he would use glasses. The following year, in 1937, Detective Comics number one would come out, the first true DC comic book. Now, although Detective Comics had been the longest-running book series of the time, it wasn't really till that fateful day in June of 1938 that Action Comics came out and would change the face of comics. Action Comics number one had a cover featuring a man in red and blue lifting a car over his head. This was, of course, if you haven't guessed by now, Superman, the first comic character to have powers far beyond a normal human being. Now, wait, I know, I know, Flash Gordon, he was in fact around and he was in fact cool. And the Shadow is also fighting crime in perfect darkness. But come on, sci-fi hero, a misty hero, neither could lift the car over his head, and they couldn't let, let bullets bounce off their chests. Or, they weren't faster than a locomotive, able to jump tall buildings in a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, no, wait. Behind that plane that's falling, it's Superman. Here to catch us, here to catch that plane we were looking at while it was headed right at us. I mean, come on, a plane heading right at you, aren't you just gonna run just a little, not stand there and freeze? But I digress. Siegel and Schuster had tried pitching Superman before, as far back as 1933. The, and comics and newspapers said nobody wanted to read that. Little would they know that Superman today is one of the top 10 most recognized people on the planet. Well, of course he is. I mean, movies, books, cartoons, TV series, product endorsement deals, celebrities naming their kids after him, and I hear from an insider that he's even thinking about cutting his first album entitled Dark Side of Krypton, and a new single called Kryptonite Gets Me Every Time. Now, kal -El is fine if you like goody-goodies who wear bright colors, but I think everyone really started paying attention in May of 1939. It was in this month that Detective Comics number 27 hit the stands, and with it the first appearance of Batman, a grim and gritty hero facing cold hard facts. When a villain featured in this comic fell into a vat of acid which killed him, old Batman just replied, a fitting end for his kind. Batman, created by Bob Kane, has always remained in print, even when superheroes weren't so cool. He kept his popularity by focusing his comic on his detective abilities over his awesome superheroics, making his book more mystery and suspense than other building-jumping, tight-wearing farm boys. Now that we have two great heroes, what was the world to do? Well, how about the May 1939 debut ripoff of Superman? That's right, Wonder Comics. Number one came out starring its Wonder Man. No, not Marvel's Wonder Man. This Wonder Man was virtually identical to DC Superman. So, of course, DC took Victor Fox to court for copyright infringement. And since we haven't seen that Wonder Man since, you can bet that DC won that case, and Wonder Comics were no more. And finally, in this part one of Superhero History 101, we have to mention that Superman broke the mold again by receiving his own titled book in the summer of 1939. The book simply titled Superman would only tell of Superman's adventures. You see, before this comic series would feature a variety of characters in their stories. But of course, history was made and now most superheroes now have their own titles. And that wraps up part one of Superhero History 101. Look forward to more parts on the history of superheroes on future episodes of Variant Edition. All right, that's it for Variant Edition. So our big wrap-up bit this week, our website. It's been too plain for too long, so Kevin's been working on that. Yeah, so check out variantedition.com and you can see it go through some changes. We're going to be redesigning it in steps, so hopefully when the dust settles and it's time to explore the new site, it'll feel fresh and new like a spring day. And if we're lucky, nothing will be broken. Hmm. <sighs> Along with the web redesign, we'll be continuing to bring some brand new things to the show. After Thanksgiving, we'll have a few more new segments and a return of some older ones. Yeah, if you have an idea for a segment, let us know. We might even listen to it. You know how to watch us. iTunes, VO, YouTube, Google, and Google Video. Or get a new, sweet, high-res version from Blip TV. But if you want the easiest way, just head over to VaryEdition.com and watch us on our page. And check out the sponsor us, link in VaryEdition.com, to see how you can get some of our cool new Variant Edition t-shirts. That's it for Variant Edition. See you next time. I so missed a thing. Yeah, you did. That's yeah. why I picked it up. I know. And it's good, and we're using it. Did you change your shirt?